The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Now, a representative of our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Your future is his business. Security in years to come for you, your home, and your family. Yes, your future is in good hands when you entrust your life insurance program to a representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Ladies and gentlemen, in about 14 minutes, Mr. Keating is going to tell you about the Equitable Society's famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Because this chart is one of the most important services of the Equitable Society, I urge every member of this audience to listen carefully. Remember, it's the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers, available from representatives of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Musical Frame-Up. At this time, the Federal Bureau of Investigation can announce to you that on the basis of a survey recently completed, the total value of property stolen in the United States this year will approximate the staggering sum of $125 million. It may give you some idea of exactly how staggering an amount that is when you realize that it is some 18 times as much money as the United States paid for the half million square miles of Alaska. If Alaska seems too far away, or if you think that the value of money has changed so materially since the Alaskan purchase, consider the fact that the value of property stolen this year is greater than the amount of income tax paid by the people of 28 of our 48 states. No matter what comparison is made, $125 million is a large sum of money. To know that it was stolen this year is a sobering fact but one which pales before the accompanying information that the figure is spiraling and that unless something is done to abate the current crime wave and done in the near future, the figure for next year will be larger. And let those numbers answer the people who say that crime will always be with us, so why worry about it? Crime, as you can see, has ceased to be a necessity. For the American people, crime is now a luxury, a luxury they can ill afford. Tonight's file opens in the offices of a music publishing company in Tin Pan Alley. In the small rehearsal room of this establishment, a man is seated at a piano going over the lyrics of a song with an attractive young woman. You see, Ruthie, this is the chunk of the melody we want to sell. So kind of punch with the lyrics right there, will you, baby? Oh, sure, Marty. Shall we try it again? Okay. All right, sugar, right from the intro, huh? Hiya, Marty. Hiya, boy. Huh? Remember me? Jack Logan. Logan? I met you on the coast. That party at Carlisle's Ranch, remember? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I do, yeah. Sure you do. I heard you just flew in yesterday. That's right. How's everybody out there? Fine. Good, good. I read in Variety where you wrote a musical. Huh? Yeah. Say, look, uh, Jack, I'm kind of busy right now going over a hunk of these lyrics right here. I come to see you on business. What do you mean? Well, that variety story said you were going to audition the show tonight. You were using some rich dame's joint on Park Avenue, right? Yeah, Mrs. Adams. Trying to dig some backers, huh? Yeah. Well, Marty, I got a guy who's real loaded, and he's dying to bust in the show business. No kidding. How would it be if I brought him up there? Swell. Well, look, Marty, I- I've got a date at the hairdressers. Oh, sure, honey. Uh, look, uh, huh? call me later, will you? I'll give you the address and the starting time then. Sure, sure. Well, be talking to you, kid. Right. I'm sorry, honey. Who's that character? I don't know. Just met him once. Sounds like it could be mob dough, Marty. Mob, schmob. These days you got to take any dough you can get. Come on, sugar. Let's make with this lyric. (laughs) Man, 
Quite a layout, huh, Steve? Yeah. Who are all these guys? People invited to maybe back the show. Oh. Which is the dame that owns the joint? I, uh, I think that's her over there. Flashing all the ice. Oh, yeah. She's supposed to have six jillion. <laughs> I can believe it. Where's this songwriting guy? Oh, that's him over there at the piano. Hey, Marty! Marty! Hi, Jack. You here a second? Sure. Hey, I'm glad you could make it, kid. And this is the fellow I told you about. Steve White, meet Marty Scott. Hello, Mr. White. Hello, Marty. Well, you guys just park any place around here. We're going to get into action in just a minute. Oh, we're okay right Look, here. Look, now, uh, I suppose you know an audition ain't like doing the show in the theater. We just give you a rough layout in the book, hit you with the tunes, maybe a couple of dances. Oh, Marty, sure. Yeah, honey? We're all set. All swell. Look, now, we're starting. We'll take a break after we go through the first act, then we'll spread a little whiskey, huh? I'll see you later. Yeah, yeah, All right. Yeah, sure. Right. Is this a regular custom, Jack? Yeah, sure. Sometimes these turkeys do more shows in apartments than they do in theaters. Oh. How long will this first act take? Oh, I'd say at least a half hour. Well, as soon as it starts, we better get busy and find the old dame's jewelry. Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk when Agent Don Campbell approaches. Hello, Don. Hi, Jim. Did you uh, stop by your desk on the way over here? No. Well, we're teamed up on another case. Oh? Jewel robbery. Interstate? Yeah. A few days ago, the SAC got a memo from my Los Angeles office. It seems they received an anonymous phone call out there. <laughs> Jim, I think you better start at the beginning. <laughs> okay. Now, let's see. Uh, six weeks ago, the wife of a movie producer was robbed of about $30,000 worth of jewelry. It was one of a series of thefts that occurred after people had left big parties. Any descriptions of the thief? No, none good enough. Sounds like maybe somebody at the parties was in on it. That's what L.A.'s anonymous caller said. He also stated that the jewelry stolen at the last party, which was at a Mr. Carlisle's ranch, could be found back here. That's not much to work on. Oh, there's more, Don. When the SEC got the memo from L.A., he sent a copy to the police. Well, they knocked over a fence today and recovered a good part of the loot. It could mean the thief's still around. Uh Uh-huh. The police are going to notify us if the same modus operandi is used here. Fine. I'll call you before I leave, Don, so let's start working on this first thing in the morning. Joe is just another guy. I really often wonder why. I'm so in love with Joe. I'm so in love with Joe. Okay, everybody, okay. That's the end of the first act. Now grab yourself a drink or some food. We'll start the second act in 15 minutes. Oh, Ruthie, honey, you were terrific. Oh, thank you, Marty. How did Mrs. Adams like it? Hey, I'm not so sure she did. What do you mean? Well, she walked back there about ten minutes ago and never showed again. Oh, well, that doesn't mean she didn't like it. Well, there's only one way to know. Let's go find her. This is the Come on. Okay. okay. Excuse me, please, ma'am. Oh, Excuse me. Right here. Please. Go ahead, Ruthie. Oh, thanks. Gee, well, guess this is the bedrooms and stuff back here. Yeah. Plenty of doors to choose from. Um... Why don't you kind of call out to her? I don't know. It's kind of like yelling in a church. <laughs> Let's see what this place is here. What is it? Well, where I live, it'd be a room, but here it's a closet. Let's try this one here. Okay. This is a kind of a den deal. Hey, look over there on the floor. Oh, Marty, it's Mrs. Adams. Yeah. Oh, she's really out. Is she breathing? Yeah. Hey, Marty, look. Look over there on the wall. Well, it's a safe. It's open. Uh-huh. Hey, she ain't got her jewels on either. She's been robbed, Ruth. Uh, look, Marty, we'd better call the police. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. She only came in here a few minutes ago. Whoever did this must have been here when we started. Hey, wait a minute, Ruthie. I'll see you later. Where are you going? I think I know who did this, and I'm going to find him. <laughs> Don, 
I'm glad you're still here. I uh, just leaving. Police headquarters just called. There's just been a jewel robbery. The pattern was like the ones on the coast. Oh? What's the story? A woman named Adams was robbed of jewelry and government bonds. Where? At her apartment. She had a lot of people there for an audition that was being held for a musical comedy. How long ago was this, Jim? The report came in about 15 minutes ago. Hmm. Any description on the thief? No, the woman was in her library. He came up behind her and knocked her out. The police able to hold the guests? All but one, a man named Marty Scott. He apparently had arranged the audition. What happened to him? Well, a girl was with him, and they discovered the robbery. Scott told her he knew who did the job, said he was going, and then he left. Marty Scott? Yeah, he's a songwriter. You know him? No, but I got a rundown on him from the police. He's a bit of a character, and he drinks a lot. I wonder if he's been in California recently. According to the police, Don, he just got back. Any criminal connections? Well, the police are checking on that now. Oh, one other thing. This Scott stole a car from in front of the apartment house when he left. Oh. The police have already sent out an alarm on it. Say, Jim, what about a teletype on Scott to the L.A. office? That's a good idea, Don. And we'll go up and interview with that girl that was with him when they found Mrs. Adams. Jack. Yeah? What's through the soda on ice? Oh, well, they said they were sending the boy right up. Yeah. Any more stuff there? Well, there's a bracelet, and that's it. Let's have a look at it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that's nice. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, that ought to bring about 3500 Hmm? How much? Uh-huh. What do we do with these barns? Burn them? No. They look real hot. I got a fence that'll take a stove. Look. That must be the bell room. Yeah, hey, wait. I'll stash this. Okay, let him in. All right. What? Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Marty. Mind if I come in? Well, Marty... Thanks. Would... Uh... Hello, Mr. White. Oh, hi there. Uh, look, Marty, we're busy right now. Yeah, I just stopped by to find out what happened to you. Oh, uh, we had to leave. Yeah, I know, I know. I saw you go before the first act was over. What did you have to leave for? Well, we had a date. Why but... don't you tell him the truth, Jack? What's that, Mr. White? We didn't like your show. Now, how about leaving here, eh? Not till I tell you something. There was a robbery at that apartment tonight. Somebody slugged Mrs. Adams, took her jewelry, robbed the safe. No kidding. It happened just before you left. Hey, wait a minute. Are you trying to say we had something to do with it? I'll let you answer that one. Hey, look, Hold Marty. It, Jack. I'll answer it. Like this. <laughs> this guy wanted to go to the cops. Let's fix it so he does. We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now a quick interview with a man sitting on top of the world. A man who got rid of a ten-year worry in ten minutes flat. That's me, Mr. Keating. Honest, I can't thank my Equitable Society representative enough for bringing that fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. That's fine, Ed. Tell us just what the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers did for you. Well, just like you said, Mr. Keating, I got rid of a ten-year-long worry in ten minutes. Before I got hold of this chart, I used to lie awake nights worrying what would happen to my family if I should die unexpectedly. And the biggest part of that worrying was... I didn't have a ghost of an idea what income my wife and kids would need to live on without me. This chart opened my eyes. No question about it, Ed. This Equitable Society chart is an eye-opener and a worry chaser. Not one man in 50 really knows how much money his family would need to carry on without him. What they would require to maintain a decent standard of living until the children finish high school. The Equitable Fact-Finding Chart for Fathers and Mothers gives you a reliable basis on which to figure the minimum expense. What's more, it's simplicity itself. Every step is made absolutely clear by easy-to-understand pictures. My wife and I really enjoyed filling it in. Once you have the facts, it usually turns out to be much less of a problem than you thought. Uh, by the way, Ed, how much did this fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers cost you? Why, not one cent. It was free. Yes, this chart is just one of many services available from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. It does not obligate you in any way. Just drop a hint to any representative of the Equitable Society, and he'll be glad to see that you get a copy. Or send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file. The musical frame-up.
There are in the United States approximately 140,000 law enforcement officers. Their job, as their name indicates, is to enforce the law and to arrest those they find guilty of breaking that law. To repeat, that is their job, not yours. And therein lies the lesson the Federal Bureau of Investigation would like to bring home to you tonight. If you know of a case in which any crime has been committed, do not attempt to deal with the situation yourself. For the true criminal must be dealt with by those who are familiar with his tricks, by those who are equipped to fight him and to capture him. It is not that the local police and your FBI do not appreciate help from the public, for many crimes would remain unsolved without such help. But make sure your help will do some good, will help remedy the situation brought about by the crime. If those are your intentions, then your course is a simple and an easy one. It is, in fact, the only logical course for you to take. Merely pick up your telephone and call your local police. Give them the start, and they will finish the job for you. Tonight's file continues in a small room at police headquarters. Sorry to keep you waiting, Miss Graham. Oh, that's all right. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Yes, I know. The police told me you were coming. You're a friend of Marty Scott's. Yes. How long have you known him? Oh, off and on, about five, six years. Well, the police have given me a background report on him about his drinking. They say it's gotten him into quite a few scrapes in the past. Do you know about any of these? No. Have you ever been with him when he was drinking? A few times. But he seemed more like a paper hat drunk than a trouble guy. Or was he drinking at this audition tonight? Not that I know of. What were you doing there? I was singing some of Marty's numbers. Oh, I see. Now, uh, when did you get to Mrs. Adams' apartment? Mm, about 8.15. And who was there? Marty, a dance team named Carrie and Ollie, mm -hmm. a couple of chorus kids, and about a dozen squares who might put up some money. And uh, you were with Scott when Mrs. Adams was found? That's right. Now, let's see. You've testified that he left stating that he knew who committed the robbery and was going after them. Mm hmm Did he mention any names? No, he... Uh, pardon me, please. Oh. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, Captain. You have where? Hmm. Yes, I see. Yeah, thanks very much. That was a report on Marty Scott. What about him? He's just been found unconscious in a oh. stolen car that he'd driven into a concrete wall. Oh. According to the police who found him, he reeked of whiskey, and in one of his pockets they found some of Mrs. Adams' jewelry. Oh, Mr. Taylor. Oh, yes, nurse. You can see Mr. Scott now. Oh, fine, thank you. Go right in. Thanks. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials, Mr. Scott. Oh. I thought it was another one of those pulse and thermometer kids. How do you feel? Awful. I ain't been hit so hard since they dropped my last option. Do you mind answering some questions? Look, I know what you're going to ask me. I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. I was framed. Oh, by whom? Two guys named Jack Logan and Steve White. Mm -hmm. They came to Ms. Adams' apartment to see a run-through of a show I wrote. In fact, I invited them. Where did you know them from? I just knew Logan. I met him at a party some guy named Carlisle threw out on the coast. What does this Logan do? I don't know. You meet a lot of guys at a party, but you don't give them a saliva test. What makes you think they framed you? I saw them blow the joint early. When I found Miss Adams, I had a hunch they did it. So I went to see them. No. They knocked me cold. Then they must have put me in a car, drove it into a wall, spilled whiskey on me, and put some of the loot in my kick. Well, they didn't steal the car. No. I did that. Look, I know that hangs one on me, but all I can say is I couldn't find a cab, it was raining, and I was in a real big hurry. But you can believe me, mister, I didn't take the other stuff. Melodies, I may steal, yeah, but not jewelry. Where can I locate Logan and White? They're at the Park Hotel. Okay, I'll go over and see them. I'll check on your story. Thanks. I'll get back here to you later. Right. Oh, uh, by the way, yeah? I got a tip for you. When you go there, wear a helmet. Jim. Yes, Tom? Teletype just came in from L.A. on Scott. Huh? He attended that party at the Carlisle Ranch. Yeah, I know. I just finished talking to Scott at the hospital. You got a confession? No. Let's go back to my desk. Okay. Huh? Go ahead, then. Right. 
What was Scott's story? Yeah, he claims he was framed by two men named uh, Jack Logan and Steve White. Did Scott admit being at the Carlisle party? Yeah, he said that's where he met this Logan. Why did these men want to frame him? Well, according to Scott, they're the ones that robbed Mrs. Adams. It's not a very strong alibi. I know, but we've got to go along with it until we prove otherwise. It's true. He gave me descriptions on this White and Logan. Why don't you check back on both of them with I did, huh? Okay, I will. While you're doing that, I'll go over and see them. <laughs> We answer that, Steve? Sure, why not? Okay. Yeah? I'm looking for Steve White or Jack Logan. I'm Jack Logan. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Oh. Who is it, Jack? Fellow from the FBI. Have him come in. Come on in. Thanks. That's Mr. White. Hi, Mr. White. Hi. Think I know why you're here. It's about that robbery last night, right? Yeah. We were just going to get in touch with the police. Oh, really? Yeah, we got some information. Figured it might be useful. Yeah. Well, you can give it to me. Well, uh, you are talking about the Adams robbery, right? That's right. Uh, we went to her apartment earlier for that, uh, uh, what do you call it, Jack? Audition. Yeah, yeah. I brought Mr. White there. Thought maybe he might want to invest in the show. Oh, I see. I didn't like the music, so we left. Well, is this what you were going to tell the police? Oh, no, no, no. We got something real important. After we left that place, we came here to Jack's. About a half hour later, there's a knock on the door. Jack answered it. It's his friend. Uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Marty Scott. Yeah. He'd apparently been hitting the grog real good. Yeah, and he was staggering. Why did he come here? He said he needed some dough. We couldn't handle that. And then he digs in his pockets and comes up with a handful of rings and bracelets. Ask if we'll take him for security. That's right. Turned him down on that, and he left. Make any trouble? I mean, was he uh, violent? Oh, no, 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 no. We eased him out, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, you say this was last night. That's right. Why didn't you notify the police then? <laughs> we thought it was junk jewelry till we read the paper today telling about the sticker. Oh, I see. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I'll pass your information along to the police. If we need you for anything else, we'll call you. <laughs> Jim, I just got a report from Ident. On Logan and White? Yeah, they both have previous convictions. Yeah, I thought they might. White's for jewel robberies, Logan's for being an accomplice before the fact. Mm. Here they are. Thanks. This makes Marty Scott's alibi a little more valid. Yeah. Yeah, but truthfully, Don, right now I don't know who did the job. Did you see White and Logan? Yeah, I interviewed them. They admitted being at the party all right. They also said that Scott had visited them after the party, that he was drunk, and that he tried to sell them the jewelry. Mm-hmm. It would clear them. While I was talking to them, though, I noticed a spot on the rug that had just been washed. Did you question them about it? No. No, I went out and got a search warrant and returned to their apartment. They'd left. I applied a reagent to the spot. It turned out to be a blood stain. Well, that's one for Scott's side. Yes, especially since I've been told there'd been no violence while Scott was there, that he'd just quietly left. Oh, I'll get it. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right. Thanks a lot. Police headquarters, Don. Oh? They just did a thorough examination on the car that Scott was found in. The police picked up a clear fingerprint behind the rear view mirror. It belonged to Jack Logan. Well, that really makes this a whole new case. Yeah. Uh, Don, let me see those records again, will you? Yeah, here. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Let's make some phone calls. I think I know how to find out who really stole those jewels. <laughs> for Philadelphia, Washington, Miami. Passengers, please have their tickets checked at gate 15. Did you get the call through, Steve? Yeah. Guy's meeting us at the airport in L.A. Uh-huh. Will he handle us, then? Sure. Good. What about the bonds? He can move them, too. Uh, it was a real audition, Scott Rand. Huh? <laughs> There's no business like show business. <laughs> hey, Steve, I just happened to think. Huh? I got a new title for Scott's show. The State Pen Follies of 1950, 1951, 1952. Flight 111, ready for immediate departure for Chicago, Albuquerque, and Los Angeles. Passengers will please board the plane through gate 12. Ah, that's us. Yeah. Let's go. Just a minute. Huh? What? Don. Yes, Jim. You can relieve Mr. White of that package. Right. What is this? You just come along. We'll explain it all to you on the way to headquarters.
Jack Logan and Steve White were tried and found guilty of interstate transportation of stolen property and sentenced to prison terms of 20 years each. Special Agent Taylor, in re-examining the records of White and Logan, noticed a definite pattern in their operations. When they committed a jewel robbery on the West Coast, the loot always turned up in the East. On Eastern jobs, it was fenced in the West. While at their apartment, he also noticed that their luggage carried stubs from airline baggage checks. He therefore called all of the airlines, checked on reservations made for the West Coast, and obtained results you have just witnessed. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is more than ordinarily pleased with the outcome of this case from its files, not only because this time both criminals were removed from circulation for a lengthy period, but also because it was able to perform the highest function of a law enforcement agency. It was able to prove the innocence of a person who was justifiably under suspicion. Your FBI has always operated on the theory that it was far better to let 99 guilty men go free than see one innocent person convicted. And it shall continue to operate on that theory, shall continue its job of protecting you, the American people. In just a moment, you will hear about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. But first, our Equitable Society representative on the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. I'm speaking for the nearly 8,000 Equitable Society representatives from coast to coast. We Equitable men know from experience what this fact-finding chart can do for parents. We know what it can mean in terms of future security and freedom from worry. So... Ask your equitable representative for a copy of the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another exciting case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A dramatic reenactment of crime at a county fair. Its subject... Armed Robbery, its title, The Big Case Out. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Grace Albertson, Michael Ann Barrett, Harry Bartell, Bill Conrad, J.C. Flippen, and Sidney Miller. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The big case out on This is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.